Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Kazerman, Vice President of Government Relations at the New Jersey Society of CPAs, and welcome to this special edition of Issues Watch Live. Today's broadcast is being sponsored by Provident Bank. I'd like to introduce Josephine, Josephine Moran to say a few words. My name is Josephine Moran, and I'm the Executive Vice President and Director of Retail Banking at Provident Bank. Welcome to the New Jersey Fiscal and Economic Outlook webinar. We are a proud supporter of the NJCPA, and we are happy to be a premier sponsor for the last 10 years. Provident Bank has been supporting the communities we serve in New Jersey for over 180 years. We offer a variety of financial solutions to businesses with a commitment you can count on. For more information about Provident Bank, please visit us at www.provident.com. Dot bank. During this webinar, the current economic environment in New Jersey will be discussed, along with how the pandemic has impacted New Jersey's businesses and state budget. Once again, thank you for tuning in. We are pleased you are joining us, and we hope you will find this webinar informative. Thank you, Josephine, and thank you to Provident Bank for sponsoring this event and for being a longtime supporter of the NJCPA. So now let's move on to the show. The coronavirus pandemic has had a devastating impact on New Jersey's fiscal condition, as well as the economy, obviously. Governor Murphy says we're looking at a shortfall of $10 billion between now and the end of the 2021 fiscal year, which ends on June 30th. There are several very fluid variables that lawmakers face as they as they address this projected shortfall. For example, the governor has proposed a controversial move to bond $10 billion to address the problem. But the Senate president has balked at this. There's also a measure in Congress that would send billions to states, which would obviously help to fill our shortfall. But Senate Republicans are holding this up as they seek liability protection for businesses in exchange. And of course, it's very difficult to project what state revenues will actually be between now and next June. So today I'm joined by two esteemed guests who know a whole lot about New Jersey's budget and fiscal issues. As a matter of fact, when it comes to those issues, these are my favorite uh, go-to people. Uh, we have Senator Stephen Oroho, who represents New Jersey's 24th Legislative District, and he is the Republican budget officer and ranking member on the Senate budget, I'm sorry, ranking Republican on the Senate uh, budget committee. Welcome, Senator. Jeff, thank you very much. Very, very glad to be with everybody today. And I'm a proud member of the New Jersey CPA Society. So thank you. Oh, yeah. You know, I forgot to mention that or somebody accidentally edited that from my script. So uh, our apologies, my apologies. That's okay. And uh, our second guest is uh, John Reitmeyer, who is the State House reporter for New Jersey Spotlight, and he provides in-depth coverage of state budget issues. Welcome, John. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate the invite and the chance to be able to talk shop with you guys today. Uh, look, looking forward to the discussion. So we're going to discuss the state's fiscal condition the mini budget that was just adopted, and more challenging and controversial, the fiscal 2021 budget that has to be adopted by September 30th. So let's uh, take a look at the mini budget that just passed. New Jersey's constitution requires the adoption of a balanced budget by June 30th. However, to help deal with the coronavirus emergency, in April, lawmakers passed legislation to extend the current fiscal year to September 30th. That law also required passage of a mini budget by June 30th to cover the months of July, August, and September. Before we take a look at the uh, mini budget, as, uh, as everybody likes to call it, let's first take a look at what has transpired from a fiscal perspective since uh, the coronavirus shut down a significant part of the economy in mid-March. Senator, what has uh, 
What has the impact been on state revenues since mid-March? And has the state uh, cut its spending to offset the loss in revenues? Well, Jeff, thank you very much. I, it's interesting, the, the amount that uh, has been talked about as the shortfall, has it had an impact? It definitely has had an impact. The, our three largest um, you know, revenue, you know, uh, revenue streams for the state budget would be the uh, gross income tax. Now the largest piece there is obviously we were able to um, afford everybody the ability to pay their income tax on July 15th, it's coming up uh, next week. So um, we'll, see, we'll see what kind of uh, you know, revenue comes in you know, from there. Um, I got to imagine that most people were getting a refund. They probably filed early, with, as we would probably recommend they do. Um, but anybody who was paying probably took advantage of, of not paying until, uh, until the last minute. Um, but certainly it has an impact on sales tax when you shut down most of the economy and also on the, growth, on the uh, corporate business, on the corporate business tax. But interesting enough, um, I know when we, we did get a revenue uh, forecast from the governor's office, and when we first started this, there was uh, there were really no details of what was what had been happening. Um, when uh, Senator Sweeney had asked myself and Senator Sarlo to start the, a committee to help reopen, um, quite frankly, the some of the revenue numbers came in better than what had been expected because originally the uh, governor uh, governor's administration had figured that we'd probably be in lockdown until the end of June. Uh, we were able to influence a little bit earlier opening up and we, I'm sure we get into it, but I think we can, we, we've got to get the economy um, of New Jersey open and going. But the, but the estimates were all over the place. We heard 10 billion. And then when the governor was down with the, uh, you know, President Trump, we heard 20 to 30 billion. And everybody said, where'd that come from? And quite frankly, even people in the administration said, we have no idea. And then I think there were some news reports that said, well, it's you know, going to need a lot of ventilators. Well, I got to tell you, 20, 10 to $20 billion worth of ventilators, that's a lot of ventilators. Yeah, so every- uh, believe me, there was no. And then, obviously, I know uh, uh, John um, had, a, had a, an article about what the real revenue shortfall would, would be. Um, and I think John, you thought it was probably within a range of, you know, five to six billion. And I think Jeff, you and quite frankly, I, I think that's probably where we're where where we're realistically at um, is probably right around that eight, that range. Has anything been cut? Um, no, most of the stuff's been deferred. That's been uh, that's that's pretty much what's been uh, been happened most uh, most of all. But I'm sure we'll get further into a. A discussion. Thanks, uh, Senator. So, uh, as I think I mentioned before, last week the governor signed a $7.7 billion mini budget, which covers the months of July, August, and September. John, can you give us a brief rundown of what's included in this money, uh, in this mini budget, as far as spending taxes and cuts are concerned? Yeah, sure. And so if you think in a normal year, the state spends almost 40 billion a year. So if you slice that up into quarters, now it doesn't really work this way because the revenue stream isn't you know, symmetrical and the spending is you know, not exactly the same over the, the four quarters. But you know, this would be about a, a first quarter with um, some reduction. So almost 8 billion is not quite the 10 billion that you might think we would spend in a normal first quarter. This is just now a fifth quarter of FY 2020. So as the Senator mentioned, a lot of the, that reduction there is deferrals. And so the big factor for this, this, this mini budget is deferring some big ticket items from that September 30th deadline uh, into October, which gives them more breathing room because the state constitution doesn't allow for deficit spending. So they're pushing off a a planned quarterly pension contribution, which is about a billion dollars right there. And then there are school aid payments, special education payments and municipal aid payments that are all being deferred as well. And so a lot of the breathing room comes not from say uh, year over year cuts, but from a, some of these big ticket um, deferrals. Now there are some, what they're calling de-appropriations 
that uh, kicked in as we hit the June 30th to July 1 changeover. And there's a long list that I uh, published last week that, um, you know, unfortunately we didn't get the best information from Treasury on this yet, but some of them represented simple shifts in funding from f uh, state sources to federal sources. Some of them are what the, uh, we generally call lapses in, in, in Trenton, where there was spending at the beginning of the fiscal year that was projected to be necessary. And then maybe by the end of the fiscal year, we didn't quite reach that amount. And so they get savings that then can lapse into the general fund. And then in some cases there are actual cuts. And I guess what remains to be seen is whether the uh, tax payments that the Senator referred to that are coming in uh, next week. And I'm, and I'm asking a lot of questions about that right now and we'll be writing about it. Um, you know, there's some question as to whether that, that's going to be robust enough to maybe take some items off of that list. And then the last thing on taxes, the governor back in February was talking about increasing taxes. You probably heard about a millionaire's tax, a cigarette tax increase, some other tax increases. He's put them to the side, and I'll say for now, because that was only put to the side for this June 30th to July 1 requirement for the mini budget. He also put some proposed spending increases to the side for now, including for like a ramp up in K through 12 education aid and some other things that basically got us through that June 30th to July 1 mini budget deadline with everything in balance. But yeah, as the Senator mentioned, the, the real noteworthy thing are the, the big ticket deferrals, which just push those bills into October and make that nine month truncated FY 2021, a much more difficult task to balance because we might still be in this uh, uncertain revenue environment. And now all of a sudden you've heaped on expenses that typically are paid during the first quarter of a fiscal year and now have to get shifted into that remaining uh, three quarters. Right, right. So uh, we're really just talking uh, a couple hundred million in real cuts as opposed to the, what are they saying, 2.8 billion or 3 billion cut in spending. Um, yeah. But, I mean, uh, unfortunately what they did, one of the things in the, the administration will say there's no tax increases, but one of the cuts they did make were to the senior freeze program and the homestead rebate, you know, program. Uh, so right. that was, uh, you know, unfortunately you'll see some of the, uh, you know, those, those people's taxes, actually their net tax position um, liability going up. Right, right. So the majority party Democratic lawmakers supported the budget, I think unanimously or almost unanimously. And the minority party Republicans in both houses voted no. Senator, as the ranking Republican on the Senate Budget Committee, can you tell us why your colleagues voted no? Yeah, well, Jeff, and quite frankly, first of all is, is we, we all voted and we supported the idea of extending the fiscal year. And quite frankly, I wish, now I wish we had never done that because we're the only state that did and there were other ways to deal with it. And unfortunately, it gave the administration some more time to, you know, um, to, to delay, which we think things that should have been done. Like, for example, um, the, you know, the whole idea of the furlough program, which could have saved a lot of money. Uh, we gave these ideas and it was on a huge bipartisan basis. Uh, it was on, I think there was only one no vote when, it, and then in, in, nearly eight weeks ago, it got to the governor's desk. And unfortunately he you know, sent back his uh, conditional veto that basically took out almost, we believe, and any kind of the savings. So that was, you know, when you take a look at it, there were all kinds of ideas that we had put forward. Um, the, you know, uh, Ralph Thomas had, been, had sat on the Path to Progress report. The idea of, if, if you're gonna make, obviously, long-term structural uh, changes, when would there ever be a better time to do it than now, right? And particularly going forward. So we had suggested, let's get the, uh, you know, and we finally, uh, the governor did sign the uh, health, um, healthcare legislation that was put into, into, into effect. And then also, we had also recommended the hybrid pension plan. Even if we did it for new employees, that would save significant money going forward. The other thing that we kept uh, suggesting that they do 
is be significantly more aggressive with respect to the sourcing of income. Because let's face it, New York, uh, New Jersey gives a lot of credits that, you know, essentially go to New York City and New York State and other states, but predominantly New York for people who work in New York and live in New Jersey. But let's face it, this pandemic has changed a lot of that. And right. quite frankly, that could be hundreds of millions of dollars. And they, quite frankly, ignored not only Republican suggestions, they ignored, ignored their own party su uh, suggestions as well. And quite frankly, I, I think some of the, I think some of the uh, strategy of the administration is try and make it look as bad as possible in order to uh, say we need a borrowing program or right. we need a federal bailout. But that's, that's the reason why we uh, you know, voted no, because uh, we think a lot of more uh, other things could have been done and let's not keep pushing it down the road. Great, thank you. Um, let's move on to what the 2021 fiscal budget might look like. It's very hard, at least for me, to make any kind of prediction as to what it might look like. There are just so many moving parts and variables that can have a very big impact. So let's take a look at some of those uh, variables. Uh, of course, one that's been mentioned already is the governor's bonding proposal. There's federal aid that we may or may not get. And there's also trying to predict what state revenues will be over the next 12 months. So those are some of the main variables. Uh, and if there's any other variables, gentlemen, that you see, let's discuss them too. But let's start with the bonding. Um, the governor says that there will be a $10 billion shortfall over the next 12 months. And that uh, 12 months will end just about at the end of the 2021 fiscal year. This is the hole that he hopes to plug by issuing bonds. So my first question is, just how accurate is that $10 billion number? T to me, it looks, and I'm not great at math, but to me, it looks more like roughly $6 billion. So the administration has estimated $34 billion in revenues uh, that will come in over the next 12 months. And last year's budget was about $39 billion. So there we're looking at a $5 billion hole. And then let's add 2% for inflation and we have a hole of roughly 6 billion, not 10 billion. Am I missing something here? Uh, John, let's start with you on this one. Yeah, sure. And I think your assessment's very fair. Um, and I think when you hear this 10 billion number uh, and I've tried to write about it to just put it in some context, uh, 10 billion, first of all, goes over more than just one fiscal year. And so a big slice of that, say two to three billion, we just closed out what would normally be the end of June 30th and, and Treasury's still accounting this. And as the Senator mentioned, the extension of the fiscal year has created all kinds of accounting nightmares for people you know, who, who have to do this stuff professionally for, for Treasury and Division of Taxation. So they're still accounting a lot of it on a 12 month fiscal year as we normally do. And so getting at out of June 30th, the projection was around two to three billion. I think it came in, we haven't seen the final numbers, but we know that they upgraded the uh, forecast at the very end for the 12 months original of FY 2020. And so I think you're gonna be closer to that two billion figure. Um, when we look ahead to what would normally be a 12 month FY 2021, to get to 10 billion, Murphy's counting spending that he wanted to do as part of a budget that was put out in February before the pandemic hit that sought tax increases, sought spending increases. And so the revenue projection that was issued back then for the 12 months that would start July 1 uh, assumed uh, all of those things would have been approved by lawmakers and enacted into law last week. So that all didn't happen. So we, uh, your starting point, um, if you use the fiscal year budget that was approved for FY 2020, it would have run out on June 30th, that, that was 38.7 billion. Um, they project through the end of uh, a 12 month FY 2021 for revenues to come in around 34 billion, a big year over year drop off, nothing 
to downplay or say is not significant by any means. Uh, I covered the Corzine administration when they had to deal with a four and a half to five billion shortfall and that, that was a difficult, difficult time. So I think we're probably in that type of a scenario again. The, the challenge is those projections came out in May. And as the Senator mentioned, you know, we didn't know where we'd be in June, in this point in July, we don't know where we'll be in August in terms of what's happening in the economy. And so we've seen some bright spots in the recent tax revenue reports. We're due to get the June report within the next few days, but the, the report for May had year over year uh, sales tax uh, revenue that, that wasn't as off as I thought it would be, and income tax because we had to throw out the April numbers because we didn't have payments this April, that year over year weren't that bad either, suggesting that withholding's been fairly strong. So, um, you know, that $34 billion number that the administration has put forward, I think if they had another crack at that in July versus in May, it might look a little different. But in order to say there's a $10 billion shortfall, you have to build in a lot of assumptions that um, if you just look at actual budget figures, I think it whittles down closer to that figure that you've come up with. I think that's a very fair assessment. And I, I, I don't think Murphy's... Um, assessments were, were made in bad faith. Uh, it just built in a lot of assumptions that we weren't there yet. You know, senators, long, other lawmakers hadn't approved any tax hikes and, and they've shown a resistance to approving them in recent years. So we may not have ever reached those revenue figures that they were projecting back in February uh, without the type of tax increases that they were also hoping to enact that, you know, have now been cast aside um, for the time being. Right, right. Jeff, Go ahead, Senator. just real quick, because John brings up a very good point in, in, the, in the assumption of a $10 billion shortfall. And that's, that's the idea of spending that they would like to do in the original budget. And quite frankly, we, the, uh, a number of the uh, Senate Republicans, uh, actually the Senate uh, uh, Republican budget members, did send a letter to the administration uh, saying, put out the right message about you know, early on to try and, um, you know, to, to uh, let municipalities, counties, school boards know that they should probably look to sharpen their pencil a little bit. And unfortunately, that never happened. Can one of you just uh, briefly give the specifics on what this uh, bonding bill, if it passed, what it does? Uh, if I recall correctly, and I'm always trying to recall correctly, um, does it uh, allows for uh, five billion in general obligation bonds without a public, uh, without public approval, and then it also, what it allows up to nine billion in uh, in effect uh, issuing bonds that are bought by the Federal Reserve or or something like that. Is that correct, Senator? There's a whole. You know, it's interesting. Uh, this is Steve. But uh, Jeff, you're right. Now, the, what they keep saying is five billion. It's not five billion. The, the five billion is the only number that you see in the um, you know in in the bill itself. Uh, the assembly passed it pretty much along party lines, I believe. Um, but the Senate president, Senator Sweeney, has said he doesn't he doesn't like the bill. Doesn't think it's it's he thinks it's too premature. I absolutely agree with that. Um, and also, there's a lot of a blind check in that bill because what it does is, you talks about the five billion, but then there's under the CARES Act, there's the, the municipal liquidity facility, that the state is pretty much already approved to be able to get 9.2 billion, 9. Point, I think it's 9.265 to be exact, but uh, say 9.3 billion dollars that they can go for over and and for a three year period and pay uh, um, an interest rate obviously on that. And then the bill also authorizes some short-term borrowing in order to be able to uh, re-lend it to the municipalities and counties. Um, and then the bill then says, you know, well, you can take the short-term stuff from the federal government, the short-term stuff, we want uh, authorization to, to, to borrow, and then go and refinance it on a long-term basis, all without any voter approval. Um, and I'll stop right there, but there's many statistics that uh, quite frankly, they're, um, they're think, I believe that there are assumptions on the interest rates that they could borrow 
um, is way low. It's way low. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we can go over some of those numbers, but we can talk about some of the history of the borrowing in New Jersey because it would be if, if they took everything that they have or looking for authorization to do, this borrowing would be more than five times, closer to six times, the largest borrowing, which was, you know, single borrowing was ever done by the state on a general obligation, which was the pension obligation bond, which was at the time two points, I think 2.7 billion. This would be anywhere between five to six, uh, total five to six times higher than that. Wow. So, uh, John, uh, getting back to what the Senator just said about no public approval, there's definitely going to be uh, legal challenges to that. Can you, uh, that, you know, and the challenges would be that it's on, uh, that according to New Jersey's constitution, it is uh, unconstitutional. Can you explain that to us? Yeah, sure. Um, and so I already mentioned the constitution requires a balanced budget. And so there are two clauses that come into play here. Uh, that I pay a lot of attention to writing about budget issues. One of them is the appropriations clause, which says your annual expenditures have to match up with your annual revenues. And basically the treasury can't function on July 1 without a balanced budget. And the other one is the uh, debt limitation clause, um, which restricts how the state can use borrowed funds and says when they have to go get voter approval when they issue general obligation bonds. And the senator is absolutely right. In this case, the refinancing um, would be 35 year, up to 35 year maturities. And I think we were told uh, debt service costs would be around 50 million for every billion borrowed annually. Um, so this, this could definitely uh, have this, the potential to really add up uh, well beyond you know, what, what the bill says. Um, the issue that uh, Republicans have already said they will sue to enforce is uh, there's a clause in the Constitution that allows some of those restrictions to be relaxed during a time of emergency war um, you know and I think what we're going to get into the the for constitutional law which is not my forte but uh, from my understanding of the issues at, at work here uh, a, a case that was uh, resolved over a decade ago called Lance V. McGreevy, former uh, senator and now Congre uh, and former Congressman Leonard Lance, um, challenged the McGreevy administration over plans to basically finance uh, uh, an annual spending uh, bill with uh, bond proceeds. And they said that uh, the Constitution does not allow, uh, that debt limitation clause does not allow the proceeds from bond sales to be counted as revenue when you're balancing a budget. You can use proceeds to, to, to uh, buy something, build a bridge, uh, build a school, uh, but not just to, to use as general revenues. And what would be important here is not to offset sagging revenues. And right. so uh, the, the, there has been um, uh, some case law since then that, that backs this ruling up. The question will be, can it be relaxed in an emergency? Not only can they issue bonds without voter approval, citing the emergency uh, uh, clause, but also relax that standard and that case, those, those decisions that have said bond proceeds can't be used generally as revenue, not to, again, not to, to use as, as capital, you know, to buy something. Right. And so, what, what we'll see tested if it gets that far. And, and, and you know, we'll see if the majority Democrats in the Senate even, even let it get that far, because I'm hearing a lot of resistance, um, at least to the current construction of the bill. Um, but the constitutional issue will be one, can they push the envelope on that emergency definition? And two, is this even an emergency anymore? Because I think what you're starting to see uh, they closed out the end of FY, the, the 12 month FY 2020 without needing money from borrowing. And as the Senator mentioned, the mini budget is also balanced with no money from borrowing. And so we got through what would probably be, and we don't know what's going to happen with the virus going forward. So I don't want to get ahead of myself, but assuming the current status quo, we got through what you could argue what were the most difficult phases of this pandemic with no borrowing. And if we can't, balance a future budget 
with revenue certified from a bond proceed, uh, unless we're in an emergency, uh, the Murphy administration will have to make the case in court that we continue to be in the type of emergency that would trigger that clause. Maybe difficult circumstances still, but I think one of the issues that will be discussed if it gets this far will be, uh, are we truly still in that emergency situation when we're reopening different parts of the economy and we are starting to talk about uh, things that you know were put on hold for a long time during the most difficult days. So, um, you know, this this will be a really important and fascinating legal case. Right. Uh, if if we get to the point where this gets passed by the Senate and signed into law, and uh, I'm not even ready to say that's definitely happening. Right. So, Senator. Um... It seems to me that even if there are significant spending cuts, at least this is, this is what I thought before I uh, heard what John was saying and what you were saying earlier. So it seemed, seemed to me and maybe still does seem to me that even if there are significant spending cuts, we are probably going to face a multi-billion dollar hole in the uh, fiscal 2021 budget. And it would seem that the only way to fill that hole would be either some sort of bonding or tax hikes. So, Senator, would you support limited bonding to avoid tax hikes? Well, first of all, Jeff, I, I think it's way, way, way too pre premature to say that, okay? Because, uh, first of all, uh, we see that the revenues have come in uh, better when we were – uh, responsibly opening up the economy. Um, we have certain things that certainly the administration can do to make sure that, like, for example, New Jersey residents could pay less taxes if they were more aggressive against New York. And as I said, the New Jersey residents would pay less taxes. And let's face it, they are working here in New Jersey. That could be lots, and you know, uh, on on a yearly basis, there's almost $4 billion of tax credits that are given, almost $4 billion. You know, as John said before, our total uh, you know, budget is right around the $40 billion. That's 10% right there, right, that we give in, in those taxes. So if, if New Jersey was more aggressive in defending its own residents against other states, quite frankly, I think that would be a significant amount of money. The other thing we talked about is, you know, the health care uh, savings that we could have the hybrid pension plan, things that we should absolutely do that unfortunately they've ignored, you know, you know, to do. Uh, can the administration go and borrow on, a, on that short-term basis? Uh, they already can do that from the municipal uh, liquidity facility, but obviously that's a short term. Um, and quite frankly, I know that they've been asked the question, what well, do you think you can do it without any tax increases? Let me just give you a little um, about how significant this is. The, as I said before, the largest bonding, and this is what really scares me a lot, the largest bonding ever done for New Jersey is $2.7 billion back in, I think it was, what, 1997, I think, for the pension benefit obligation. There's still $2 billion of that outstanding, still $2 billion outstanding. And the amount of uh, interest costs have already, they exceed $10 billion. So, 2.7 billion of that uh, originally outstanding is still 2 billion outstanding today. And, we're to, and, and the administration is talking about the uh, authority to borrow five to six times that amount. So we have to do everything we can not to, because you know, if, if, if they're allowed to borrow that kind of money, there's no way that this state could ever you know, be able to, to, without massive, massive tax increases. And we already know how bad New Jersey is in, on a competitive standpoint. Right. So let's move on to the possibility of a white knight coming in, which would be the state getting uh, federal aid. I believe the House of Representatives, controlled by Democrats, passed legislation to provide a couple hundred billion in relief to states and and, and large cities. But again, if I recall correctly, and I wouldn't be surprised if I am or if things have changed, but uh, the Republican controlled Senate is holding it up, seeking in exchange to get coronavirus related liability protection mm -hmm. for businesses. 
Uh, so, Senator uh, and John, is, is my recollection correct? If not, what is the status of federal aid for uh, states in Congress? Uh, I think I'll just say, I, um, I think your recollection is correct. I, I think there's some articles out today where I think both, um, uh, I think um, Senator McConnell has said that they would, are looking to take something up uh, maybe sometime, I think, in August or something like that. But you're right. I think one of the things, and, and we've done a lot of meetings with uh, industries around the state, Senator Sarlo and myself, Senator Singleton, Senator Louise, and one of the things that they're significantly concerned about is the um, liability protection. And right. so I, I do think, I, I do hope that um, the, uh, the federal government does have something in there about it, because let's face it, you know, um, we've become too much of a litigious society, in my opinion, way too much of a litigious society. But, um, and who knows, obviously, who's going to, but the one thing I definitely know, we got to get the economy going, because there's absolutely no way that um, we have, to, if, if, hopefully there'll be a vaccine shortly, um, but we're all, all going to have to be responsible to learn and, and live with it, because we just can't keep the economy, you know, uh, locked down the way, you know, the way it's been. Um, so I, I do think that, hey, listen, if New Jersey pay, pays a lot of money down to the federal government, I would certainly uh, fight for, you know, our fair share of that. Um, I am, uh, from what I'm hearing, I am hopeful that there will be something uh, that, that's coming. I think this has gone on longer than what a lot of people uh, expected. So I do think that there will be, there will be something uh, coming in, it's one of the reasons why I think any kind of borrowing approval is way, way, way too premature. Right. So you think we, we it's a good chance they'll work out a deal in Congress. Uh, I've heard and, it from both sides that yes, they think they will. Oh, okay. Uh, that's, that's good to hear. Um, and John, I assume you've been hearing the same sort of stuff on that yeah, issue? I, I, I think the only thing I would add is that, you know, we are seeing now different circumstances in other states, and a lot of these issues do tend to break down, uh, unfortunately, along uh, political fractures. And so when you saw a lot of uh, Democratic states struggling and you, you have a Republican-controlled Senate, um, you know, that's going to play a factor. I think now that we see sort of the pain spread around a little more, there might be a little more agitation from uh, Republican senators to come up with some sort of uh, second relief package because their states, you know, the, the virus is not uh, discriminating against uh, where it goes and who it hits. And so now you're seeing some of those red states get, get hit as well. And they are the needs that, that have developed here will start to develop there as well. And that, and that may motivate uh, a little uh, change in, in opinion or, or it seems to be in where things are headed now. Uh, and, you know, don't forget, this is a, a presidential election here. And so we may see mm -hmm. some of that influence the decision making as well. Um, a lot of uh, the Senate's up for control and a lot of House seats are on the ballot as well in November. And so, uh, you know, that's going to all be part of the calculus. Uh, I have a hard enough time keeping track of what these guys do in Trenton. So uh, <laughs> right. that's how I feel. <laughs> yeah. People are always asking me, well, Jeff, you're in politics. So uh you know, is uh, Mitch McConnell going to do X, Y, and Z? I'm like, look, I don't know what Senator Sweeney's going to do, <laughs> or the governor. I don't even know who Mitch McConnell is. Um, I think John's. I think John's. Um, you know, insights are very, very. Uh, um, is very, very astute. <laughs> so uh, let's look at the what um, may be the governor's budget proposal, the one he has to put together by. Uh, August 25th, which is the day he has to issue uh, a budget proposal for the truncated fiscal year. So, Senator, uh, what do you think that budget proposal might look like? Do you think he'll include tax hikes? I, I think he will because I think he's shown a propensity to every time he's, you know, except for this short period one, uh, he, he has. And so I, I wouldn't expect anything, anything different. Um, obviously we're, you know, in a, we'll be in a, in, in a recession. Uh, I think what we've seen many, many times when you raise taxes in a recession, that's the wrong thing to do. 
Um, but at the same time, um, I think he's, if he doesn't get his, uh, you know, borrowing, um, you know, scheme or enough of the federal bailout, even if he does, I, I think this, you know, administration has shown that they, they do want to have a lot of, you know, tax increases, which quite frankly, um, we don't need. Right, right. Um, and there are other, I, I would say, we're going to continue to suggest all the suggestions we've given, uh, particularly we have to have some real structural changes because let's face it, there's going to be some significant changes structurally as we, as we go forward. And as John had mentioned, we're not really sure how long it might go on for. So we should be making those, you know, changes for the long term now. So let me ask a hypothetical question. If the bonding legislation, let's just assume, assume, uh, that it is enacted uh, and then it's struck down uh, by the courts, what will happen? Well, I guess we kind of touched on this. What would happen with the multi-billion dollar budget gap? And, uh, you know, taxes would be one option. Uh, real cuts, uh, you know, like in health and pension, I'm sorry, pension and health, re, uh, uh, benefits would probably be an option, uh, but, but not happen. So, um, and I guess we would probably see a push for tax hikes, but are, are there any other options out there that, uh, could possibly be enacted that would provide significant cuts? Do, do you realistically see anything, assuming the worst case scenario, uh, no big federal aid, uh, no bonding money of any sort, no super rebound in the, um, in the economy and tax revenues. Any thoughts on how uh, a budget hole would be, um, would be plugged? I mean, I, I think we can look to history and we can also look to, um, you know, what's basically left. Um, so, you know, 10 years or so in the wake of the Great Recession, you know, John Corzine had to manage that big budget deficit. And one of the measures was not making a, a, a pension payment. And that was when we were still making annual payments instead of quarterly payments. And so the state used to make its pension contribution all at the end of the fiscal year, lump sum a billion dollars. And so the, the, the one year Corzine basically made no payment. We didn't contribute that right. year. And, and, you know, we are, it wasn't the only year for sure, but, uh, you know, we are one of the worst funded, if not the worst funded uh, public worker pension system in the country due to a long history of that. You know, I, I don't think this administration is, is anxious to skip pension contributions. But when you get to that point in a year, you just look at what are the big, you know, the big ticket items that are left, assuming, yeah, we don't, I, I mean, I think tax increases will be on the table. I think you've already heard the governor mention what he calls revenue raisers. Um, I think, and I haven't talked to Senator Orho about this, but I think Republicans, I would acknowledge at some point an openness to tax increases uh, as part of a, a broader solution that would involve, um, you know, some sort of uh, um, opportunity on the reform side. Um, uh, so, you know, do we get to that point as well? Uh, when we talk about federal money, that's still definitely an option. John Corzine got $2 billion in, in federal stimulus money. Importantly, that was unrestricted. And so we have received money by what was called the CARES Act yeah. uh, a few months ago, but it's very restricted in how it can be used. And so that's tied the state's hands a little bit. Um, and then, you know, what Chris Christie did after he took office, and there was still a shortfall to fill, uh, uh, education aid took a hit, you know, K through direct aid to K through 12 school districts. And so it's that old saying about, you know, robbing banks, because that's where the money is, you know, what we can do is look at the big ticket items, and where's the money. And then that's where you have to turn for either cuts or increases. And so you, you would probably hear more talk about a millionaire's tax. Because I think the, the idea among the administration is if somebody's still filing returns as a millionaire uh, during the, this recession or, or, or um, whatever we're going through, they can afford to contribute it a little bit more 
so um, some of the social services programs don't get cut. I think that's how you'll see it framed. Um, and I think on the other side, you will see Republicans say, um, before we start about to talk about any tax increases, what are we doing on the spending reduction? And the last thing I'll mention is, I think we are under pressure from the credit rating agencies. You know, New Jersey, we haven't brought this up yet, but New Jersey has always had some level of an A rating uh, next to its name. And we are now through, uh, with all big three credit rating agencies at the last rung of whatever their scoring system is in that A scale. We're as close as we've ever been to a triple B or you know, whatever the next drop down is for, for, for each uh, rating agency. And I think that they're looking at us right now and saying, is New Jersey doing enough to keep uh, expenditures matched with revenues? whether that's taking advantage of reform opportunities or increasing taxes, I think we are under a lot of pressure right now to not be the next state that falls down out of that A, A range that we've always been in. And um, I think the Murphy administration will see, a, um, will face a lot of pressure in what it does going forward as part of this nine month budget. Um, I'm sure this governor doesn't want to be the one that's in office for that big, what would be an, a really noteworthy downgrade. Um, certainly we had a lot of downgrades under the previous administration, um, but we were always in that A range and, and we're in danger now, very, very real danger of falling out of that. Mm. Uh, well, you know what? I'm sorry, go ahead, Senator. Jeff, just real quick. I mean, you and, and John made a, a perfect case as to why the um, idea of spending cuts structural reforms, uh, telling everybody to uh, tighten their belt a little bit, should have been done three months ago. Right. Um, and and you know, you know, quite frankly, as John mentioned with the bond rating, you go out and borrow that kind of money, there's absolutely no, we're already on negative credit watch. There's absolutely no way that there wouldn't be, in my opinion, there wouldn't be a credit downgrade. Okay, uh, we just got a question coming, coming in from uh, one of our members, so. Here it is. Uh, it's kind of uh, a, a slightly different topic here, uh, but uh, we are living in a virtual world now. How do you see this impacting New Jersey transit? And I, I assume they're referring to the fact uh, or the notion that maybe less people will be traveling by mass transit. I, I, I think 100% uh, agree with that. I mean, I used to tra take New Jersey Transit. I was one of the guys who used to commute into New York City for 18 years. Um, and I do think it, this kind of virtual um, uh, life that we'll be living is going to have, obviously, significant impact on public transportation, transportation, um, you know, uh, otherwise. But also, the whole idea and the, the biggest significant issue is that how many more people maybe say moving out of the city into New Jersey or into the yeah. suburbs of New Jersey, or, you know, quite frankly, how many of the people are now going to spend more time working either in a satellite office in New Jersey or right in their own home office in New Jersey. And, and, and Jeff, that could end up being, you know, more than a billion dollars for New Jersey a year. Uh, just if New Jersey is more aggressive, the administrations are more aggressive at protecting its residents. Right. So let's close out our discussion by moving away from uh, the fiscal uh, budget and spending issues and talk. let's talk a bit about the impact of the pandemic uh, on New Jersey businesses. So gentlemen, now that we're about midway into phase two of reopening, what have you been hearing about how it's going, uh, how businesses are uh, responding, not responding, but how they are doing economically? Are they surviving? Are, are sales picking up? How's it going for uh, the states, uh, especially their small businesses? Any sense? I mean, from everything I've been hearing, and it, I, I think it's very industry and almost location specific is that you know you've seen some businesses almost thrive in the sense that they were able to pivot maybe change their business model take advantage you know you think about the restaurant industry and being able to take advantage of consumer habits regarding you know takeout and curbside 
uh, and things like that. Uh, you know, other businesses sound like they've been really, really uh, handicapped by, by some of the closures. And, you know, you think of, of businesses that you, I interviewed the um, operator of a physical therapy business not too long ago. And that, you know, you can't do physical yeah. therapy over Zoom. I mean, I guess you can try, but it's a really, <laughs> uh, in, you know, you need to be working with your client and your, your heart just broke, you know, interviewing some of these um, individual business owners and recognizing how very real and existential this has been for, for them. Uh, and, and trying to keep uh, their books balanced. And so uh, I think it goes across industry go, and it goes across location. Um, you know, certainly some places have had a tougher time, even in New Jersey with the pandemic than others. Uh, you know, you think of the, the gyms, uh, you know, um, I, would, I would hate personally to be in that situation um, right now because it, there's just so many pressures uh, and, and you really have to be able to, to move and, and adapt on the fly if, if, if you can even. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do hear that, uh, you know, there is some reason to be hopeful um, because, you know, as the senator mentioned, some of the assumptions, you know, built in a long-term closure. And so there have been, you know, even some of the car dealerships uh, have been able to get back to at least doing some activities. You know, that's a big source of our sales tax revenue. Um, you, you go across different segments of, of the economy. Yeah, I, I tend to look at these things a lot as just numbers and, and, and dollars and cents. And you forget a lot of times there are, you know, real people behind all of them. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I hear a lot of different things. Unfortunately, I can't say it's all great, um, at, at least not right now. You know, you think about even hotel revenues, and so how do you how do you go down to the shore right now? Um, and then we come back to how that affects things like municipal budgets, which rely in, in a lot of those shore shore locations, um, even out in the senator's neck of the woods, um, vacation homes where uh, you know people are used to having uh, a lot of rentals and producing um, tax revenue off of that. So. I, I don't want to use a broad brush, you know, you hear some horrible stories and then you, you also hear some great stories about businesses that have adjusted and, and figured out a way to thrive even. So um, really it's just one of those things where uh, I'm cheering for him, you know, being objective as a journalist, but I'm, I'm cheering for him. Yeah, I tell you, I think John um, was very, is right in that some businesses have learned how to adapt, but when, the, when the executive orders say you can't operate, um, unfortunately, and, and then they they can't, and, uh, and unfortunately they've been you know cited for you know summonses and, and whatnot. But when you're on the phone, I've been on the phone many times with a number of small businesses, and when you have a small business owner crying on the phone because they can't, uh, they don't know how they're going to be able to maintain. They've put their life savings into this. This is. That was your life. It, it, it's extremely emotional. And there's a lot of, and there's quite a bit of that when you're talking to business owners. Now, yes, they did the PPP and, and the unemployment and whatnot. So you still have a, a significant amount of the population who is getting some cash flow. But hmm. the businesses aren't getting the cash flow. And yeah. so, quite frankly, I, I see that as, as a long term thing. But that's one of the reasons why Senator Sarlo, and I'm very proud that I've worked with Senator Sarlo and Senator Louise and Senator Singleton to allow some of these industries to try and demonstrate to the administration that they know they have to be responsible. They've spent money looking to be responsible. They know they have to get the confidence of their customer or their employees or they're not coming back. Um, and there are a number of businesses that were essential businesses and they were left that they had to get the confidence of their employees to come back. They worked through it. Some of them had a, a number of employees who had contracted uh, the coronavirus and passed away. So they had to work through that. So we do have some experience of people who've been through it that we can learn through those experiences. And But the one thing we have to do, businesses want to open up. They want to open up responsibly. They need it, and so does the state need it. Well, gentlemen, this has been really fascinating, and it's going to be very, very interesting to see what happens in the coming months. 
Uh, Senator John, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, for our viewers, if you have a colleague who missed today's broadcast, we will be replaying it for CPE credit on July 13th at 2 p.m. and then again uh, on July 17th at noon. And we have a few more Issues Watch broadcasts coming up. On August 4th, representatives from the uh, AICPA and the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy, they'll be joining us to discuss CPA Evolution, which is an initiative that aims to transform the CP, CPA licensure model to reflect the changing skills and competencies of today's CPAs. On September 9th, we'll be going over Governor Murphy's proposed budget for the abbreviated 2021 fiscal year. Richard Keevey and Dale Florio, who helped us analyze the governor's original budget, uh, which came out in March, just as the pandemic was hitting, they'll be back with us to analyze the new budget proposal. And on September 30th, we'll be presenting a professional issues update on legislative, regulatory, and professional topics impacting CPAs. Issues Watch events are free for NJCPA members. You can see the full schedule and you can register at the link on your screen. And be sure to check njcpa.org, njcpa pulse, the open form, and the Issues Watch podcast for updates on coronavirus related issues and more. And to everybody, thank you for watching today.